Nick Sansky, welcome to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Hi. Good, Nick. Well, listen, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on. Your friend and fellow professor, Jeremy Rowe, put me in touch with you. Um, and it's something that I wanted, to, I wanted to get more people from the education sector on to talk about pre-construction and estimating because I do have a small gripe about the amount of pre-construction and estimating people that are coming out of colleges. Uh, instead of going there, they're going to operations. But we'll get through this. Um, but for the people that uh, haven't seen you, or even haven't seen your YouTube channel, give us an idea of your background, please. So I am originally from Omaha, Nebraska, and I went to Iowa State University for my undergrad, and then I went to MIT, and then I went to University of Michigan. And that, that whole arc is based on the way that I learned uh, how to use the computer in school when I was at Iowa State. Um, and it started out, like, when I was in school, we started with hand drawing, and by the time I graduated, people were modeling things in the computer. And so that's exactly where I'm, where I'm kind of situated. Um, and in that transition, I really got into computers. Like I, I, I liked how powerful they were. I liked the things I could make with them. Um, but I quickly kind of exhausted all of the different um, kinds of you know, courses they had at the time, um, including programming. Like I knew that if I wanted to really get into the computer, I needed to learn how to program. And I just couldn't, there was a programming class, but it was pretty low level. And I just, uh, I just wanted more. And so that's when I applied to MIT and I got accepted. Uh, I thought I'm gonna go to MIT and they're gonna teach me all these really great tools. And then I got there and the first day they were like, don't you already know this stuff? Like you got into <laughs> MIT, right? Like everybody here knows how to do that. Go, go make some stuff. Um, and, that was, and, that, and, and that was really like discouraging because I was like, Who, who's gonna teach me, you know? Um, so I ended up taking computer science classes actually at, you know, uh, in, 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 in like MIT sequence. Um, and that gave me that kind of basic foundation. Uh, but then, you know, that's only a two year master's program. So I did what's called the SMARCS program, which is a master of science in architectural studies. And that was the design and computation, you know, uh, and, and they changed it now. I think it's just computation. Uh, anyway, um, but I kind of quickly realized, wow, if I, 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 I'm not figuring it out here. I not only want to learn it, but I want to learn how to teach it because I felt like that's where the gap was, was that there are a lot of people who know this stuff, but they aren't sharing and they're maybe not yes. the most effective like teachers either. And I could and was, see the writing on the wall. Yeah, sorry. Was, was that literally the, when the penny dropped um, or did you have that in your head saying, listen, I need, did you have that before you went to MIT or did that kind of just uh, kind of give you the, the, the confidence and the, the, the exact what you wanted to do? I think that was the pivot when I was at MIT because I thought like, oh, like I kind of figured out what I can get at Iowa State and I really, I really enjoyed my teachers. So I was like, well, the next thing to do is to go to the best place, right? Let's, let's go all the way to the top. And I got there and I realized that like, again, they weren't as interested in sharing, you know, they had the knowledge and they, they were making great things and they were doing great research and stuff, but I wasn't, I didn't learn what I thought I was supposed to be learning. Yeah, uh, and did, and, you, did yeah. you expect them to teach it to you, and, or was it a case of they literally taught, said to you, right, this is what you need to know, go away and learn it yourself? Yeah, basically, they were like, we're, I mean, the, their thing was they're trying to solve problems and they're trying to make things, and in the process of that, you need to learn how to make these tools and you, you need to learn these languages. And that the great thing about MIT that I didn't figure out until a lot later was it, was, it wasn't the education as much as the people and the sort of networks that they had there and the wonderful sort of like facilities that they had. Yeah. Um, the education was like sort of, you know, like the third thing, you know, it was just, it was just, it was just kind of like tertiary, but I thought that's exactly what you went there to do was that they opened your head up and they dumped in the knowledge. You know? <laughs> and I was pretty young at the time. And, and, you know, I just thought it was a transactional kind of thing. Uh, but then I, I, that's when I pivoted hard to like teaching and learning because I thought like, oh, I'll show them, you know, like yes. I'll, I'll be this great teacher and I'll teach all these people. Because again, my, my thought was I'm a guy, I'm a guy from Nebraska. I went to Iowa State University and I'm at MIT. How many people does that happen to? How many people yeah. have that opportunity? What about the people in Iowa who aren't going to be able to go to MIT, you know, but who yeah, still exactly. need to know this stuff? Yeah, so you wanted to you wanted to bring it to, to them, um, yeah. and then once once you, you completed the MAT, you went and worked it within an architecture firm for five years. Was that was that to get an understanding of what's out there and, and the, the tools that they're using and what's happening? 
No, it was because it was a job, you know, it was, I just thought <laughs> that that's what you did. You know, I was like, yeah. I am trained as an architect and architects work at architecture firms and I need to make, that's the best way to make money. And I still thought I was going to be an architect, you know? Uh, and so I worked, I was an intern at a firm in Rochester, New York for five years. So 2000 to, 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 to 2005. So that actually, so that actually overlapped the time when I was in school. Right. right. I would work there in the summer and I would do kind of jobs during the year. And they were, they were so nice to me. Uh, the firm's name is Chantrell Jensen and Stark. And they're, they're still doing great work up there. Uh, and um, anyway, that's, but it was good in hindsight, because if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have the, any kind of inkling of how the professional world like operates yeah. or any of that sort of thing, uh, you know, because I was really on the academic, you know, like path. Um, yes, absolutely. And, and that's, again, it comes down to everything. You've really got to experience it to understand it. Um, you do. And, and, w and, and through books is great, but the practical is, is probably more important. Um, so absolutely. you did that for, for five years and then the PhD. How was that? It, it was good. So I, I went to University of Michigan and I worked with Malcolm McCullough up there who wrote a really great book called Abstracting Craft. And it's a, it's a, it's written in the late nineties and or the mid, mid late nineties. And, and it's about basically how people use the computer well. Okay. And I've never seen a book better than that since then. Um, uh, obviously things have moved on, you know, since then, but he really got to it. And that's why I wanted to work with him. He was looking at the interface and the mindset that you bring to working on the computer. But I was like, that's wonderful. How do I teach that? You know? Yes the best people have that and we can point to that and we can say that we want that, but how do I, how do I help you get that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so and I worked on that for a while okay, and then ahead. I ended up getting my first job, you know, right out of school. Brilliant. And that was uh, UNC. Yeah. UNC Charlotte. Yeah. So they, I had a friend who worked there and she called me up and she's like, I know you're not done with your PhD yet, but this is your job. Like <laughs> starting a computation program, like pack your bags, you know, get up here. Very um, good. And what, what attracted you to UNC or what was the, what, what did you go and visit prior to accepting the job or did you literally take your friend's word on it? I really get myself in trouble once again, cause it was, it was a job. Like I was like, you know, Gareth, like I'm a PhD student. I'm supposed to be a professor now. Here's a <laughs> job, you know, go be a professor. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what the academic market was like. I didn't know the difference really between being like an assistant professor and a lecturer. Yeah. I just saw this opportunity and my friend, you know, uh, who, who was my mentor, you know, when I was actually uh, over, over like in Michigan was right. like, do this, apply for this job. And I was like, you, you've always told me the right thing to do. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. And I got the job. You know, I, I love, really... I, lo I love the trust. I love the trust. And that's the, the most important thing, your network, trying to yeah. tell people and candidates that your network is so important. And it's not about w w whether you want to move yeah. jobs. It's just about the knowledge and, and being able to share stuff. And that's what the podcast is all about. It's yeah. about getting the best minds and sometimes not even the best minds, but the most practical people within pre-construction and SMEing within commercial construction That's to right. be able to share as much as possible because right. as an industry, we're, we're, we're adopting technology, but we also need to open up to sharing as much as possible. And I don't think we do that enough. And that's right. And we'll sort of get to this later. But I think like, you know, I, I, in school, I never really understood the purpose of networking and, and like how important it was to have people that you trust and who value the things that you know. Um, and that's really, and that's, and that's really come around, you know, for me. Um, and so that's something that we do in school too, is to try to mentor our students, especially the ones from Iowa, to help them build networks, to help them go out and get those good jobs, help them go out, go to those good schools. Brilliant. So you, you've taken the, the, the plunge, you've trusted your friend, you've arrived in, in UNC. How, what is the, the idea in your head about how you're going to go and, and teach BIM and design and, uh, through education? Right. Have you, are you going to revolutionize the, the, the teaching at this stage or are you going to take a lot of the stuff that you learned at MIT and, and during your PhD? I mean, so the, during the PhD, um, I met this person in the School of Information. And so when you're in the architecture PhD program, you had like a minor. And my minor was, was in the School of Information, which you might think of as like library science. But of course, libraries are much more diverse, you know, and much more important uh, to the social fabric than, than we used to give them credit for. And one of the things that they do in that, in that program is they help people understand how to teach programs to, to just everyday people. 
And yeah. that was exactly what I was missing. So there was this gentleman named Suresh Bhavnani, and he got the first human computer interaction PhD at Carnegie Mellon, and he's an architect. And his PhD uh. was on how people use CAD well. So I could not have been in the better in a better place uh, and right. met a better person. Uh, and he he had this great kind of idea about teaching strategies for how people use computers well, and um, kind of a framework for learning. And it was all like science based. Like a lot of teaching, uh, pe people think that if you just know something really well, that you can just teach it to somebody else. But we we know that's not true. You know, right? Yes. There, there are yeah. better teachers, and there are less good teachers. But so many so many people out there are experts who are thrust into the role of teaching. Uh, and they are often not as effective as somebody who's a skilled, who's a skilled teacher. Um, yeah. And, and, and how, how difficult is it to have both sets of skills? Because someone uh, who is, it's like an estimator. If people ask me for an estimator, they've got to be really good with the numbers, but they've got to be a, 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 an extrovert to deal with the clients. And that's not yeah. always the case. It's, it's, uh, it's and a, is it similar with t t teaching? Yeah. Yeah. It's a small Venn diagram, like the, the amount of people that have like, you know, this, this really specialized knowledge, especially as you go up to the higher levels of some of these things, and then the people that can really like communicate it, you know, to other people. And I, I don't know, I, I come from a family of teachers, but I never considered that that was my, that that was my calling. The way that I come at it is actually from research. So in the last 30 years, like we've taken a lot of data about how people learn in the classroom, like cognitive science, like we know how to teach better. The problem is, is that a lot of people haven't studied that and yeah. like practiced that, you know. Very good. They might be a good teacher, but just intuitively, you know, be like yeah. doing these things. They have talent, but we can even do better than that. Like we, we know how different types of learners like learn. We know that there are more effective strategies, especially for teaching computer programs. And that's what I try to get out there, you know, to people um, in addition to just knowing the stuff. So I'm kind of pivot, we're kind of pivoting away from it, but sure. within your PhD, surely there should be a little module within even doing that. Is that fair to say? And I mean, that's what I studied. Yeah. So to, yeah. to kind of go back to it, what I was studying was specifically like how to teach architects computer programming. Right. Um, a lot of people grew up in school and maybe they took some programming, but it was just a little, a little piece of it. And, and uh, it's just the way that I saw it was that like, architecture is going to be software. It's not just using the tools, but we're going to have to program things and create systems, you know, and you need programming knowledge. You can't avoid it. Like it might not look like code, but you're going to be creating operations for a computer or robot or something to, to, to do. And we don't teach that in most schools, not to everybody. You know, yeah. you might go to a specific school for that or take a class in that. But I was thinking, like, what about these Iowa students? They all have to know how to program. How am I going to do that? Yeah, yeah. You know? And, and, and that, 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 that's difficult. So com computational design, talk to me a little bit about it. And when you got to UNC. Um... So I was very fortunate. And again, I blundered into this thing where they already had a computational design uh, curriculum established, they had a sequence of courses, and there was two, there was, they, they had the basic kind of design classes and sort of, you know, digital design classes within the studio, but they were like, we're going to place a bet on computational design, we're going to have a foundational level course and an advanced practice based course in computational design. And we're going to start a master's program with computer science to train people for this, for this sort of like vocation. And I just, they had this job call and I showed up and I taught that foundation class. And I had no idea all the work that they had done with the rest of the faculty with, you know, to, 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 to make that arrangement happen. I just thought that's what it was like. You just showed up <laughs> and you got to do your dream job, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds, it's, it sounds as if it was the perfect time for someone like yourself to be in UNC or to, yeah. and it was probably one of the few opportunities around the, the U S where oh, they were that set up. Absolutely. Most schools don't have a foundational, you know, computational design program. It's an advanced studio or a seminar or, you know, whatever they were like all in. They're like every one of our 75, 80 students, you're going to learn computational design. 
Yeah, so you arrive in UNC, Nick, and you, you realize that how, how much further forward they are compared to other universities. So it, it was like a, a marriage made in heaven. But what, what's the stages after that? I mean, you were there for five years. What, where did you have to get buy-in? What were the resources like? What were the equity like? Um, right. How did they go about it? How did they want you to go about it? Who did you have to kind of get on side to be able to teach the way that you wanted to teach? Yeah, that, this is this is interesting because because when I you know again I, I didn't have much experience you know at that level you know teaching as an assistant professor my family is not really we don't have professors in the family that 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 were teaching at the university level so I didn't know I just thought that you go in and you just taught a course but what I came to realize was that just because they hire you just because they have a space for you doesn't mean that they like agree with you you know. And so I, I, I kind of learned quickly that, you know, not everybody was on board with this whole like design computing thing or this computational design thing. There is still a lot of, uh, you know, when you think about what's happening like in academia, you have people with tenure that have like been there for a while. They're more traditional, like professionals, traditional architects. Um, they're still skeptical, and I think rightly so, of the effects of the computer on the students and on the way that they like design. And so they were like, why, you know, in the world would we want more of this, you know, and like <laughs> more advanced stuff, especially that's not within our kind of like domain, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so like, and you've yeah. got to remember as well, this is 2010, like this isn't a couple of years ago. So yeah. I would imagine coming to them with that, that reality, you were kind of ahead of your time a little bit when it, when it comes to that. I mean, BIM, augmented reality, was that even on, 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 on the tip of your, your tongue when you're talking about it? BIM definitely that? was. Yeah, and, and that's that's a big question that we can talk about. I mean, again, I was even setting my sights like a little bit lower. My thing, uh, my my principle, which we can get into, is you can't even really understand BIM that well if you don't understand computation. And that's one of the reasons why people don't use BIM very well either, is because they don't understand it as a data structure. They're not looking at it like procedurally. And then to go back further, like most of the students, you know, they don't know what a drawing is. They don't know what a building is. You know, they don't know like what the different kinds of representation are. So why would I start with BIM, yeah. you know, when so you I need to like unpack all this other stuff? And that, that, yeah. that's what we'll, we'll kind of get to later. But among the faculty, though, they were, they were like skeptical of AutoCAD, you know, some of them, you know. Wow. Uh, or they were like, well, I guess we'll use SketchUp because we have it and it's easy and they can kind of hold their nose, you know, and, and, and do some digital models. But they were like, why aren't you making stuff? Why aren't you building things? Why aren't you putting things together? You know, why aren't you sketching this idea out? And it's totally valid. But at the same time, it is the 21st century and they're going to be in practice for the next 30, 40 years or whatever you got to teach, you know, all these different ways of working and seeing and making and communicating and computation is like part of that. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah and, that, and so that's where I come in. Brilliant. And, and then how do you go about peeling back that onion? Um, so taking the, 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 the students right back to the beginning and, and running through from start to finish, especially when it comes to BIM. Well, so, okay. So this is, <laughs> it gets complicated. Um, You've got seven minutes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, let's let's talk about BIM then, and, I, and then I can kind of work my way backwards. So yeah, I, okay. I, we, I will say that in our own department here at Iowa State, like we refer to Revit as the R word. Right. Um, it's sort of, it, it, it sounds kind of like Voldemort, you know, like we don't want to say <laughs> its name, you know, um, not because we don't want to teach it, but because to, to seriously like adopt it, you know, the whole picture would require a significant alignment change, you know, for us because it is so connected to process in practice, in workflows, and we don't do construction, you know, like, like we are teaching people how to design and conceptualize and communicate. We, we talk about construction, they do, you know, like structural like design. Um, we talk about sustainability and professional practice, but like we're not designing buildings to be constructed. You know, they don't, by and large, do like work drawings, like measured drawings, uh, you know, those kinds of things. That happens in a firm, and the way that firms use BIM is very specific to that firm, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if we were going to take that on, it would have to be in the context of a project and a mindset that takes advantage of all the great things that BIM does. But what, what tends to happen a lot of the time is that students are learning it because it's a job skill, 
yeah. because they're told that if they don't know Revit, that they're not going to get a job. And that puts us all, you know, uh, kind of on our toes because we're like, well, we want our students to get jobs, but we also want to teach BIM well, and we don't want it to undermine all the other lessons that we want to teach. So it's yeah. really hard, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the way that uh, BIM operates best is in coordination and documentation and, and like cost and things like that. We don't do that stuff in schools most of the time, right? Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, so, so and, and when, when you say about the, 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 exactly the architecture firm, did you ever, or do you ever have, like we have here, here in, in, in it, where, when I studied in Ireland, you have a year where you actually go and, and, and put that into practical? Some schools this. have internship programs that are built in. Yeah, and how, but how, that's do you think rare. that's effective? Yeah. yeah. You think that's effective? It's good? Or, or would you? Yeah. I mean, I think there's no, there's no, uh, when you're in school, a lot of times, like I say, you're kind of simulating things. Like you're kind of, you're the people you're working with on a project are your firm. You're the professors, like your client, you know, and, and, yeah. and it's kind of a simulacrum, but nothing is the same as actually being in practice, especially like in America, because of the licensure system, you know, you have to have so many internship hours, uh, anyway, and so it makes sense on some level if you can build that into your education, uh, or at least take the summer and work. Um, the summer that a lot of our students start is like third year in our program, yeah. and you can tell the ones that worked in an office and they come back and they think differently and they have like a little bit different approach. They're a little bit more pragmatic, you know. Yeah. But I yeah. think on the whole, it's good. I mean, that's the tension, Gareth. Like I, you know, like this podcast is about BIM and pre-construction, you know, and that kind of thing. But in architecture, we're not just training professional architects, we're training people that might go on to write software or they might become, you know, like architectural critics or like historians uh, or, you know, whatever. We're not just thinking about uh, buildings, you know, we're thinking yeah. about, you know, the, it's kind of like a generalist sort of like education. Yeah, exactly. And listen, everybody finds their path. No, nobody, you yeah. can't, if you've got a, a class of 40, 50 people or a year, they're not all going to become architects. In fact, no. probably very few of them will. And that's what it's about. It's about finding your strengths and your weaknesses within architecture right. or, or, and even outside of architecture within construction. A lot of BIM coordinators, VDC managers, directors come from an architectural background. Um, yeah. and, and that's, that's good, obviously, but they don't, come from a civil engineer electrical engineer mechanical engineer or construction management degree um do you think that's that, that i mean it, it's obviously proven to be good but what is it with an architecture that, that allows them to be good BIM bdc coordinators i mean you know the approach that we take to teaching architecture and i'm kind of blanket talking about all the schools here at this point i i feel like is again we're the last generalist like liberal arts education so you yeah. can think of it as critical thinking, systems thinking, whatever kind of buzzword you want to you want to kind of put it across. It's the ability to take in a lot of information like quickly and synthesize it into something and to share it with somebody. Yeah. All those things are like, you know, we talk about 21st century, you know, kind of kinds of you know, like skills that people need. Um, that's what we have always done in architecture is, you know, come up with ideas and talk about them with other people. And yeah. whether that's BIM as a medium or holograms or like whatever, yeah. you know, uh, that's what's going to be, and that's, that's what's going to stay the same no matter what, no matter what yeah. the platform is, no matter what the technology is, right? It's our ability to make representations of things and to, to share them with others. Brilliant. And augmented reality, is this something you're touching on it right now within, within your course? I mean, I did in this. In the spring of last year, I did a studio that was a multidisciplinary studio. Um, so it was like uh, architecture, industrial, landscape, you know, like fashion and apparel, like all the different kind of like design majors. Um, and we were looking at augmented reality um, as a as an objective. So a lot of AR stuff that's out there right now is for visualization purposes. So okay. you're trying to show a client or a contractor or something, you, you're trying to show them something, right? Or you're trying to say, this is the way this building is going to look on the site, or this is where you're going to do this weld in a particular way. Um, what I was looking at though was, was what I consider maybe the next thing or something that's in parallel with that, which is how do we design architectural spaces so that they, 
you can create an AR layer that uh, that sort of adds to the space or like finishes the space. Uh, so for example, you'd make an archway or something and then this AR thing would plug into it and it would be more than just the space and more than just the AR. Okay, now explain, that's gone over my head a little bit. Explain, explain that again, because yeah. AR, and I agree with you, it's just presentation at the moment, it's just visual. So you've taken it a step further. I'm trying to, right? So we, our, our, our objective, and this is one of these things that you have to kind of be shown, it's kind of hard to tell. All right. <laughs> this, right? But it's this idea, because I was always thinking like, it's always going to be these like dashboards and, and like visualizations of data. And my thing was like, how do we make architecture with AR? Okay. Not right. VR, but a layer that's digital, that's spatial, that's on top of the spaces that we design. And how would you even design a space in the first place so that you would you would know that you're going to add AR to it, yes, and make a hybrid space? Okay, okay, that very good. And, and and how's that been received? Well, so the pandemic kind of derailed like, a lot <laughs> of the studio. What we were doing, we had two projects that were going to be on campus that were actually uh, like demonstrations, and one nice. of them was at a, a new building at Iowa State called the Student Innovation Center. And that's one of like these innovation, you know, kind of, uh, you know, like hubs where yes. students learn like entrepreneurship and they do like digital fabrication and all that. And so we had these like um, uh, apps that we were going to deploy that would that would attach to various spaces in the building and like transform them, you know, into in, into new experiences. But we we weren't able to open the building because because of the like lockdowns. Wow. And so my students did these apps at home that were like quarantine, you know, apps. And it was like, okay, so you're stuck in your dorm room, you know, right? How do we have a meditative experience or uh, a social experience like with the space you have? So I'll give one example. I had a student who did an app that turns your bathtub into like a koi pond. You know? So you're, <laughs> you're stuck there, you're stressed out or whatever. And so you have this app and it, it, you, you, you like scan your bathtub and it, puts fish and plants and sounds and things like that into it. And it just becomes a meditative kind of thing. I had another person that did a thing that turns your closet into a rainforest. Oh, very nice. I would like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I can put examples up, but they're, so they're a really talented, you know, like group of students. Um, and we were all just doing phone apps, you know, just building stuff in unity for Android, for, uh, for Apple. Um, and it was just completely um, uh, stuff that they coded, you know, nothing okay. prepackaged, nothing yeah. like deployed with another Ma app. Yeah. Made from scratch, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Love it. And is this the future of, is this a future of construction? You mentioned digital fabrication. We had a great uh, podcast, uh, a lady called Noni Pittinger, who talked about the, the Alliance Theater in Atlanta, how they prefabricated a lot of that. Uh, I mean, fascinating stuff. And again, stuff that went over my head. Um, is, is this the future of I think, any, I think any way that we can spatialize information, I think is, is a step in the right direction. And like by that, I mean, it's not, you know, it's so crazy that we're still using drawings for everything, you know, that everything's flat. It's on, it's in, it's on paper in a lot of cases. Um, that's the way that we talk about things. But of course, things are in space and they're three-dimensional and they have a scale, right? Um, and VR, you know, is interesting, but it completely takes you out of, you know, any of those other like references. Um, and it's not very social, you know, it's hard to have a conversation like across like VR because you're simulating the other person. AR is that like sweet spot is that you can use all of the things that you know, like cognitively about the way space works and physics and your social cues and layer information on it without the mediation of like a screen or a piece of paper or like whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's why Apple's investing in it so heavily, I think. I'm, I, I don't know this for certain, but I really, AR is like the next killer app. I, I, yeah. I really strongly believe that. Yeah, yeah, it, it looks like it. But I'm really, I'm really interested to see how you use it in this extension. Do you think post COVID that this is gonna be given the go ahead and you'll get access to it and it'll be built the, the innovation hub? Well, that that's built. We just weren't uh, we weren't on campus for the opening of it. Yeah. Okay. So that that yeah. building is open. That's actually where our robotics lab is right now. That, right that we're working in. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and how are the um, how are the students receptive to the whole robotics thing? I mean, is it something that fundamental part of your course? We are just we just got the robots last year. 
Um, and a lot of schools have had them, you know, but what, what we like to say at Iowa State is that we kind of like leapfrogged a lot. So we didn't buy the first generation or whatever. We're now on like the second or third generation. They're cheaper, they're like, they're, there's better software, you know, so they're just much easier. If you're gonna make that investment, it's nice to be the second person, <laughs> not the first person. And we're lucky because we have a lot of colleagues at other schools who have kind of made made mistakes or who know how things work and we can read and that's actually we we still talk a lot like with UNC Charlotte, you know, and their and their fabrication folks over there to help us figure out our robots. Um, but we're just now getting so so I have a colleague I work with named Shelby Doyle and she is teaching the first robotic or she taught the first robotics class in the spring. And of course the lockdown, you know, hit that too. Um, but we're just getting it into the, the mix. Like it's, it's just an elective class. Um, but ultimately, I mean, ro robotics are going to be such a big part of, of life, not just construction, but, but yeah. we're talking about architecture, right? Yeah you know, having, having drones or swarms, you know, I mean, not just like Roombas, you know, but <laughs> yeah. um, the idea that you would be working in partnership with a machine to accomplish something, that's a big, that's a big idea. Yeah, it's um, a big leap. Um, and yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's happening, it's happening right now. I mean, so it's not, it's not, it's not a leap really now when you think about it. I mean, it's happening right now, but what, in 10, 20 years, what what's it going to look like? I mean, how how involved are these, and how how reliant are we going to be on robotics? I think well, robotics definitely because you think about the expenses and and of of construction, you know, and the kinds of things that architects want to try to do today. And every time you invent a new system or you want to design something that no one else has ever seen before, you have to completely make a construction process, and you have to train people, and you have to get quality control. In all these, and this is where like, you know, a lot of things like Frank Gehry's buildings ran into a lot of problems, right? Because he was trying to do things, you know, with tolerances and materials that no one else had like done before. And that's what made them amazing. But that also what's, that's what made them leak, you know, right? Um, and I think in order to mitigate some of that risk and in order to do things that we were never able to build before, I think we have to involve robotics. I think that's what's really exciting about it. Not to take people out of the loop, like construction workers and contractors and all that kind of thing, but to augment the way that they work, you know, and, and to allow us to do more things experimentally. Um, I think we're going to think, also have more feedback loops with them. Yeah. And I robots. think Nick, it, it, we're, we're not going to have a, we're not going to have a, um, we're not going to have a say in this. We need help when it comes to construction. The next two decades, there's going to be 80 million people that are going to come to the USA, whether it's born or, or immigrate. And we need hospitals, we need roads, we need right. warehouses. It's, it's, it's not an option. It's just about how quickly we can make it happen. That's right. Well, and if we don't, right, then some other industry is going to eat our lunch. You know, they're all, yeah, it's going to exactly. be all prefab or there's, the robots are just going to do all the stuff. And like, we, we, all of us, like academics, like designers, you know, everybody needs a seat at the table. And that's where I think education can really play a role. You know, you, you see a lot of things from industry influencing education, such as BIM, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you need people trained and you need people to have the vision that can come into these offices and say, here's, here's what we're experimenting with or what we're researching or what these possibilities are. You know, can we try this? You know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's where the partnership, I think, works, works, Absolutely. works especially and, well. And communication and partnership you mentioned there. So in Iowa, where you're at now, do you, do you get visits from the architect firms, from the GCs? Find out what, right, what are you working on? What's yeah. happening? It, good. Yeah, you, we, we absolutely, support? we depend on those relationships, you know, because we are a part of the communities. We are making sure that they're aware of the work that we're doing and the kinds of students that we're producing. We have um, an advisory council that's made up of local practitioners and they're all the way out in the, in the area. So all the way out to like Chicago, um, Kansas City, um, you know, local firms like in Des Moines and, and so all, all different sizes, all different like um, all different levels and different roles within those offices. And um, again, you know, they provide us a lot of support and we are also providing them with support. Like we might, we might have projects we work on together. They're going to come to our reviews and they're going to talk to our students. Um, of course, they're going to hire our students, hopefully. Um, yeah, absolutely. But, 
yeah, we need a foot in practice for sure. And that, that's what yeah. those relationships allow us to do. Good. And are you getting buy-in from them? Do you, do you, can you kind of, when people are coming to do your course or, you, or study at Iowa, can you kind of almost guarantee, listen, we've got all these great companies looking yeah. at internships? Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. We have, this, we have a huge like, career fair that the college puts together, you know, and we're, we're, we have a nice pipeline between those offices. And, of course, those students will come back and, like, recruit our students as well. You know, we also send a lot of students to really good grad graduate programs too you know we, right. we we get students in cornell and harvard and you know cal poly like every year um, yeah. which is great you know like out of iowa state yeah so i mean it, it's pretty evident nick that you've got your finger on the pulse when it comes to this stuff what would you like to see and how would you like it to, to change it's obviously changed since 2010 you got involved in unc you're now at iowa, iowa state university what would you like to see or, or, or would you like to see invested in when it comes to giving you the tools to, to better educate the, the next generation? I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble here, but I'm going to say that <laughs> I think that we need to invest in public education. I think okay. that it begins actually at how we fund our institutions okay. um, because that's what allows us to do all of the work that we do. And yeah. the budgets have just been cut like continuously and it makes it hard to do your job because, you know, it's hard to run a lab. It's hard to like, um, you know, you're, you're not paying the right level of salary. So it's hard to get the right people to come in. And it's just, you know, it, it affects, it affects everything. And what it does too is, is, it, is that that makes it more expensive for our students. And then we're not getting like diverse, you know, students because they can't afford to come to our school to learn from us. And we're not expensive, you know, <laughs> like Iowa yeah. State is an amazing value, you know, yeah. but we're still, I think, pricing out people who need to be in architecture. Yeah. And there's just only so many ways that you can support, you know, people. Yeah. And so I, I feel like, I feel like people need to support universities, like yeah. full stop. But I, I, yeah. And I totally agree with you, but I think what, what you do as well with your, your YouTube channel is another way of getting all the, the fantastic ways of teaching out there. Uh, that's incredible. I mean, you've got what, close to 40,000 followers? Pretty, yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Brilliant. So yeah. we'll not even mention that you're nearly double the size of Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, <I agree. laughs> So, I mean, that, to me, that's, that's amazing. And if anybody hasn't checked it out, definitely get on there and check it out. And particularly, you do a great um, thing on Grasshopper. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Right. And give us a quick idea of, of the, the YouTube and what people can expect it, to the channel. And so the YouTube channel is something there. I started to set up when I was at Charlotte because I was teaching these labs to students and I would have 80 students in a lab. And you know that you can't reach that many students at the same time when you're trying to teach design and teach software. And so I was like, you know, forget it. I'm just going to record the, the lab and then I can focus on talking about the design and talking about any of the issues that students had or the misconceptions or anything in the, in the class. So I, I kind of stumbled into like a flipped classroom, you know, that's, that's a thing you, you've probably heard of before, but yeah. you know, any of the procedural knowledge or anything that's software based, I can deliver in a video. And yeah. so I just started recording all these videos and then the, some of them became lectures, you know, cause I also just wanted to get some ideas out there and it's allowed me to like effectively double my teaching, you know, because I'm not just lecturing all the time or demoing stuff all the time. I can actually coach people. I can, I can help people. Um, and the software just kind of gets pushed, pushed more to the side, which, which I really like. Um, Very good. And do you get, do you get a lot of feedback from it? Oh, amazing feedback. I get people from all over the world. Like you said, people who I'm not even sure are in school <laughs> are, are watching the channel and I feel bad because they'll, they'll ask me something and I'll get like, like, like a half a dozen emails, you know, and people are like, well, what about this thing? You know, or like, would you help me with my thesis project? And, yeah. It's like, sorry, I can't, I can't do all that for, for all of you. I mean, I have the YouTube channel, you know. But it's, it's amazing, Nick, when you think about it, when you went in the MIT, they, they went and they told you, go, go and I can't believe you don't know this stuff going i would imagine you went back and did a lot of the stuff on on youtube because everything's there i mean it's a constant question that i get from 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 especially junior graduates high school people is how do i get into pre-construction and estimating yeah. i said there is so much resource out there especially during covid if you've been furloughed or you've been let go get on youtube learn educate yourself well this is the thing though I, I, and i want to i want to be so you know you have the youtube channel you have these open resources that are out there and you can tell people, go just find the search in Google and find the video and learn it. But the thing is, is that that also 
expects that you know how to learn well from online materials, you know, that you have things that you can plug it into or that you have the resources. There are ways to learn more effectively online or less effectively, you know, like if you're just teaching yourself, there's no guarantee that you're really going to get it or that you're going to get what you need. And that's where teaching comes in, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's why I feel like education will never really go away, even if it's like online or you have all these resources or whatever. Everybody learns differently. Everybody comes at it like differently. And good teaching helps people who learn differently, you know, pick this stuff up. The people at MIT don't need your help. You know, like they, they know how to learn, you know, they're already privileged, you know, like they just, they have a rocket booster attached to them. But what I'm interested in is like the other 80% of people who don't have those resources, how are they going to be effective designers and good citizens? You know, how, yeah. how are they going to build the right things? You know? Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, it's, it's evident to me, Nick, that anybody going and, and studying at Iowa under you, your leadership will, will do well. Um, you know, anybody that wants to kind of get in touch with you, what's the best way to get in touch with you if they have a question? Or if, you can if they find me even... just, through, just, just through my Iowa State email address, and it's easy. I'm easy to find. I'm Nick Sensky, and, it's, and the email is nsensky. It's S-E-N-S-K-E at iastate.edu. That's the best way to do it through like official, uh, official channels. Brilliant. And what I'll do as well, I will put that email address under all the content that we put out there as well. That's great. Um, so listen, Nick, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy and doing everything online at the moment. So I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Thanks so much.